Is personal finance more personal than finance? Welcome to Common Sense on the Prairie, a podcast by First National Wealth Management in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We are a regional best provider of wealth management services, including investment management and financial planning, as well as personal trust, institutional trust, and retirement plan services. This podcast is our chance to share some of our passions and help you make your money work for you. Today, we have a really special guest joining the pod, author Morgan Housel. Morgan is a partner at the Collaborative Fund. Previously, he was a columnist of the Wall Street Journal and the Motley Fool. He's a two-time winner of the Best in Business Award from the Society of American Business Editors and Writers, the New York Times Sydney Award, and a two-time finalist for the Gerald Love Award for Distinguished Business Writing. And he is the author of the wildly popular new book, The Psychology of Money. Morgan, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me, Adam. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. But before we dive in, let's take care of that disclaimer. Any comments, insights, or strategies discussed in this podcast are intended to be general in nature and therefore may not be suitable for you and your situation, whatever that may be. Before acting on anything we discuss, please consult with your attorney, CPA, and or your financial advisor. All right, Morgan, I've read a lot of books on personal finance and investing, but only three have really hit me right between the eyes. Millionaire Next Door, Total Money Makeover, and your book, The Psychology of Money. Tell me a bit about your background, how you came to write this incredible book. Well, thanks, Adam. My background is I've been a financial writer for my entire career and even more than my career. I started as a, as a full-time financial writer when I was a junior in college for The Motley Fool. That was never part of the plan. I was never intended to be a financial writer. It just kind of happened um, haphazardly, serendipitously, I guess. My plan was to go into investment banking or private equity. That's what I wanted to do. I always knew I wanted to go into finance. But uh, I just kind of stumbled across a finance job. I had a friend who was a writer for The Motley Fool at the time who said, hey, you should check this out. You, you're interested in investing. You like stocks. You should check this out. And so I thought, like, A, they're never going to hire me. Or if they do, maybe I'll do this for a couple months before I find another private equity job. But I ended up falling in love with the process of writing, which I never knew that I would until I started doing it for a living. But I, re- I just really enjoyed the process of writing. Like, I, I always think of myself as interested in finance. But that's kind of secondary to my interest in writing and not even writing per se. I would say I'm just interested in what people are thinking, like what's going through people's heads. How are they making decisions? And I think finance and investing is such an incredible window into that part of your brain. Like, how are people thinking about risk? How do people think about opportunity and greed and fear? What's going through people's heads? What's going through my own head? Like that, that's the topic that I like. And writing is, I think, a good way to clarify and again, have a window into how people think about the world across all kinds of different topics. The introduction to the book is called The Greatest Show on Earth. And the reason I I named it that is because that's what finance is to me. I think finance is the most compelling window into how people think about greed and risk and fear and long-term thinking, which are topics that apply to a lot of things. They apply to relationships, they apply to careers, they apply to like all kinds of things. But you learn about other people and yourself through the lens of finance in a deeper way than any other topic. Because I think a lot of the reason that is is because finance applies to everyone. Like you might like different sports than I do, and you might have a different career than I do, but we're all dealing with money. We're all dealing with income and expenses and investments and trying to fund our retirements. Like it applies to so many people, and it's such an emotional concept. It's just such a good window into how people think. So I've always been a full time writer on that topic, and the psychology of money was kind of. I just wanted to piece together what were the 18 or 19 most important points that I've come across over the last 13 years as a writer that really move the needle in terms of how people make decisions with their money. Not just investing or not just personal finance, but this broad topic of just money, how we think about finances in general. Sure. Awesome. Did, did I hear this right? They're going to make your, uh, your book into a movie? Yeah, that's right. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> obviously, I don't have a lot of experience. It's my first, first go with something like that. Yeah. But uh, it's cool. It'll be it'll be cool to see what happens. And there's not there's not really any filming in Hollywood right now because of COVID. So right. yeah. whenever it happens, it'll be months, maybe years from now. But it's 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 cool. I think you know the book's only been out for two months, so to already have a movie deal for it is it's pretty cool. That's incredible. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so historically, when we talk about money, we tend to talk about numbers and forecasts. So why are we now talking about the psychology of money? Well, I think you know. We have made so much progress in the financial industry over the last century on the analytical side. If you go back 100 years ago, we did not understand a lot of the formulas and equations 
that we now rely on today, discounted cash flow, those kind of things, the rule of 72, the 4% withdrawal rule, like we didn't know those things 100 years ago. So we made a lot of progress on the analytical front. And we also just did not have a lot of data 100 years ago. And the people who did have data was like a small handful of people. Your average Joe on the street, he didn't have any historical financial data to go off of, but we do today. Yeah. So I think the analytical side of finance has largely been solved. We figured it out. Like we know the formulas, we have the data, but but is there evidence that we are better investors today than we were 100 years ago or 50 years ago? Not much, not that much. That we are better with our finances, that we are better at avoiding debt, saving for the future. Are we better than that today than we were 100 years ago? No, I don't think there's much evidence of that. And the reason that is, is because investing is not necessarily about what you know. It's not the data or the formulas that you have. Good investing, doing well with, with, with money, with your finances, is overwhelmingly about how you behave. You can have a PhD in finance from MIT. You can have all the knowledge in the world, the analytical knowledge. But if you don't control your mindset of greed and fear, if you cannot manage your ability to take a long-term mindset, all these behavioral aspects of money, none of the analytical skills that you have are going to matter. Like again, you could be the best stock picker in the world, but if you panic and lose your head in 2008 or in March of 2020, none of the analytical skills that you have matter. So the, the behavioral side of finance and the psychology of money is important in the, uh, to the extent that it can neutralize any of the analytical intelligence that you have that is on top of it. I think one analogy here is something like medicine, where you can be the smartest doctor in the world. You can know, you can know everything about how the human body operates and what you should do to treat disease and illness. But if you smoke a pack a day and drink yourself silly overnight, and you never exercise, and you're morbidly obese, none of the intelligence that you have matters if, unless you've mastered the behavioral side of health. Right. And finance is, is, is just the same. You can know everything, but until you've managed your own behavior, none of it matters in terms of making a difference in your own life. Sure. Oh, that's a great analogy. You and I agree that personal finance is much more personal than it is finance. And I thought you did a fantastic job explaining that idea using yourself as an example. So in your book, you talk about keeping more of your assets in cash than experts would maybe advise and also paying off your mortgage early, even with a historically low interest rate, because doing those things help you sleep well at night. That feeling that uh, that sense of security is, in my mind, what advisors should be striving for with their clients, but rarely are. Why do you think the financial advisory world has ignored the personal side of personal finance for so long? I mean, there's two things that, that are going on here. One, I love the story from Daniel Kahneman, who is a psychologist who won the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, once you win the Nobel Prize, you make a lot of money for yourself writing books and speeches. So Kahneman, you know, he's an academic, became quite wealthy. He went to a financial advisor many years ago, and he said to the financial advisor, he said, I have no desire to grow my net worth. I don't have any desire to have any more money than I do right now, ever, for the rest of my life. All I want to do is have this chunk of money, have it secured, and I can just live off this for the rest of my life. But I have no desire to grow it. He said the financial advisor looked at him and said, I can't work with you. It's impossible for me to work with you. And Kahneman tells a story with this idea that we have such a strong desire that everyone should always want to be wealthier, no matter how, no matter what your net worth is. The goal should always be able to maximize growth on your asset base. And to him, that was just bonkers. It didn't make any sense to him. But all he wanted to do, like he had no desire to become rich. He's an academic psychologist. He just wanted to be a little bit secure and ha- you'll be able to sleep at night. And that I think had a big impact on me because when he told me that story, because I, I'm not as wealthy as he is. I have not won the Nobel Prize. But uh, <laughs> my thing is, look, my wife and I have no desire to become the greatest investors in the world. I have no desire to say, you know, I beat the market by X percentage points this year. That's not like, it just has no meaning to me at all. What has a lot of meaning to me is independence and controlling my time and being in, you know, totally in control of our financial destiny so that, you know, those are, so that, that, that we're never going to get ruined no matter what happens to my career or what happens to the economy. Like all that matters to us is independence. So therefore, maximizing returns is not necessarily a a thing, but sleeping well at night, that was really meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. Now, the second part of this that I think is really important is that what I just explained for my wife and I and for Kahneman doesn't apply to a lot of other people. A lot of other people do want to beat the market every year, every quarter. They do want to maximize their investment gains. And that's great. I'm I'm not saying I'm right or they're right or either one of us is wrong. We're all just totally different people. And I think we should just embrace that in finance, that this is not like math where two plus two equals four for me and you and everyone else. And there's one right answer for everyone. Finance is not that. It's a very personal endeavor. And people just have to figure out what they want and do what works for them, even if their plan, their strategy doesn't make any sense on paper, 
even if other people disagree with it, even if according to finance textbooks, it's the wrong thing to do. If it works for you, that's great. People do all kinds of weird things with their money that don't make any sense. I write in the book that it was a little over three years ago now that my wife and I paid off our mortgage, which is, you, you mentioned this, is the worst financial decision we've ever made. Like it's the <laughs> dumbest thing you can possibly do because yeah. you can get a fixed rate 2.8% like 30 year mortgage these days. It's ridiculous. But it was the one financial decision that we've made in our life where after we did it, we looked at each other and we were like, high five, this is incredible. This, this brings us so much joy and happiness. Yeah. And it was the worst financial decision we've ever made. <laughs> that to me was just like this enlightening thing of, we should not aim to be rational with our finances. Like the goal is not to make the numbers line up in Excel. That's not the, the goal is to make yourself happier. Sure. And having this little bit of independence that the house is ours, no one can take it from us, that had so much impact on our happiness. And it was the worst thing I did. Like it, 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 it was such a powerful moment for me to realize like what the purpose of money is. It's not a math game. It's just a happiness vehicle. Yeah, my wife and I went through the same equation too. And we wrestled back and forth. Well, I, I certainly did. She just wanted to pay off the house. I was <laughs> like, you know, I was like, yeah, but you know, the time value money and all these sorts of things. And mathematically, I'm not sure it makes sense. But at the end of the day, it's like, you just have to do what's right by you. And, you know, we talk about that with our clients all the time and it is different for everybody. So that's a great point. And here's the thing. So we paid it off, you know, three and a half years ago or something. People have pointed out, hey, the market has done pretty well over the last three and a half years. Does that bother me? Do I, right. do I run the numbers about how much wealthier we would be now if we took that money and invest? And the answer is absolutely not. It doesn't bother me in the slightest. And I'm not just saying right. that to try to hide the pain that it's caused me. <laughs> it truly does not bother me in the slightest because yeah. I've had, you know, we have two young kids. I'm the sole earner in our household. The fact that we have this, a level of stability and independence to me, to us, not for everyone, but to us, is worth more than any amount of financial return that we could have earned. So the fact that, you know, the S&P 500 has gone up in the last three and a half years doesn't bother me in the slightest. Sure. Yeah. So you mentioned in your book, there's a million ways to get wealthy, but only one way to stay wealthy. Some combination of frugality and paranoia. What does it mean to save like a pessimist, but invest like an optimist? I think you need both skills over time, saving like, like a pessimist, investing like an optimist. Because if you look over history, over the long run, things tend to get better most of the time for most people. Businesses improve, the economy grows, businesses become more productive, profits grows, the market compounds over time. That's the long run. But the short run of history is like a constant chain of disaster. Go back throughout history, American history, European history, whatever it is all over the world, the short run, there's always something to worry about. There's always a recession or a bear market or a pandemic or a war or a political crisis everywhere. Like there's, there's, it's always bad news in the short run, even if the long run is pretty good and compounds into something incredible over time. So you need to be able to accept both of those. And I think the way that you can do that is by saving like a pessimist, saving with the idea that your world might get thrown upside down in the next six months, as we've all learned in 2020, happened yeah. to tens of millions of us, whether it's a personal job loss, a medical emergency, a bear market, whatever it is, there's gonna be some, some pain to go through in the short run, always. But in the long run, things are probably going to be pretty good and things are going to compound over time. So saving with the idea, like a sense of paranoia, like a good amount of cash and kind of you know, a minimal amount of debt that you can manage, but still investing with this idea that things are going to be good over the long run. And your investments are an optimistic vehicle for you to achieve that. And the reason that you need to save as a pessimist is so that you can survive financially long enough to enjoy the compounding that's going to take place in the stocks that you do own which is kind of like this conflicting personality. Like how can you be an optimist and a pessimist at the same time? Hmm. A lot of people think you should be one or the other. It's hard to kind of embrace that you need both, that they can coexist with each other at the same time. One other idea that's related to this is I've often thought like being an optimist does not mean that you think everything is going to be okay, that everything's going to be good in the future. That's not an optimist. That's, that's a complacent. If, if you think everything is going to go okay in the future, you're just being complacent and hmm. ignorant of history. I think a real optimist is someone who knows that, again, the short run is going to be a constant chain of disaster and setback and disappointment. But that does not preclude long-term growth. That's what a realistic optimist is. It's someone who knows the long term is going to be okay, but they need to survive a constant chain of setbacks to get there in the long run. So it's, it's just kind of this barbell personality that you need to do well over time to do well in investing. Yeah. Well, that's great. So financial advisors often talk about the importance of having an emergency fund or like a rainy day fund. In your book, you're talking about this concept a little bit differently. You call it having room for error, and it seems to encompass much more than just having extra savings. What does it mean to have room for error? 
there's this line I use in the book, which is the most important part of any plan is planning on your plan, not going according to plan. Yeah, exactly. Which is this idea. And we look, I, I finished writing the book in January. So before COVID, you know, was on anyone's minds or it was on my mind at least. But we've all learned this year that what really moves the needle in our personal lives and in the economy and the stock market are things that come out of the blue that no one was talking about before they happen. Whether it was COVID-19 or September 11th, or a Pearl Harbor, like the biggest news events over time are the things that no one was talking about until they occurred. Hmm. So this is why when we're making a financial plan, it is easy to sit down and look ahead and say, what are the risks that I know about in my life? What are my upcoming expenses? Well, I got to send my kids to college. I got to retire at this date. Those are things that you know about. But historically, what moves the needle are things that you don't know about until they occur, which is why you just need to have room for error in your financial plan. And you are being prepared to deal with risks that you cannot even think about, that you cannot name, that you cannot identify today. That's what it means. So a lot of people, when they are saving money, will say, you know, I'm saving money for a new car. I'm saving money for a down payment on a house. I'm saving for retirement. That's all great, of course. But I think you also need to have a lot of savings in your financial plan that is just saving for the unknown. And you know, when I talk about the amount of cash that I have as a percentage of my net worth, which is not a crazy amount, but it's higher than some people would have. Some people say, what are you saving for? Like, are, are you, are you, are you going to use this cash for a new house? Like, what's the purpose of it? And my answer is always like, I have no idea. I have no idea what I'm ever going to use this cash for. No clue. But there's a pretty good chance that at some point in my life, I'm going to need it. Yeah. But, but I'll need it for an event that I cannot even fathom today. And that's how most people's lives play out over time. So it's hard to plan for something that you can't even identify. But I think if you appreciate what the course of what happens in most people's lives over history, it's something that we should all take seriously. Sure. Yeah. In my mind, you know, it's a word of, I've used a lot this year is resiliency. You know, times like these, what we've experienced this year, you know, maybe not a pandemic, but these downturns like this, they do happen somewhat regularly. So maybe that's the lesson from all this is we need to build more resiliency into our plans. And there's one other thing that's important here is that whenever you have someone like myself who has no debt and a lot of cash, it makes me look conservative. It makes me look like I don't want to take a lot of risk. I'm not, you know, I'm, 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 I'm really putting a cap on my investing returns. And I actually don't think that's right because what really matters in investing for successful investing is endurance. Hmm. It's being able to stick around for the longest period of time. That's when compounding works the best is when you can actually stay in the game and invest for 20, 30, 40 years. That's when real wealth compounds and grows. If your lack of desire for debt or if your desire to have a lot of cash, if that keeps you in the game for the longest period of time, it means that the stocks that you do own are going to compound to the highest degree. So when I look at, at someone who, like myself, doesn't look like they're taking a lot of risk, I don't view myself or someone else in that situation as being conservative at all. I'm saving like a pessimist, yes, but it's because I'm investing like an optimist and I want to maximize the stocks that I do own to compound at the greatest degree that they can, which just means making sure that I'm never forced out of the game for either financial reasons or psychological reasons. Smart. I've talked in prior episodes about the importance of deferred gratification and how that skill can help you save more money for your future. But saving money can be difficult for many Americans, regardless of income. And as Americans, it seems uh, as we earn more, we actually tend to spend more, thereby never getting ahead. Something you said in your book actually made me laugh out loud when I read it. And in fact, I had to go get my wife and like read the line to her. She was maybe a little less impressed than I was, but that was fantastic. So you, you said saving money is the gap between your ego and your income. Talk to me about that. <laughs> I think that's true. And it's true for, for most, it's not true for everyone, but I think right. for most people probably listening to this podcast, yeah. for people that have, in, you know, their, if their income is over some, some certain level, then most of what you are spending your money on, a lot of what you're spending money on is a social signaling device. You want to buy a bigger house or a nice car or nice clothes so that you can signal to other people that you've made it and that you are someone who should be admired, those kind of things. Which is all great. Like everyone has some element of that. I'm not. I'm not suggesting people should live like a monk, but to the extent that you can suppress that desire to signal to other people how successful you are, to the extent that you can suppress that, that is how you increase your savings rate. And again, your savings rate is just your income minus your ego to that extent. And no one's ego is zero. Like right. again, I don't want to live in a tent. I don't want to live <laughs> out in the out in the boonies in a cabin. Like I, I want a nice house in a good neighborhood too. But I think. If you are looking for a way to increase your savings so that you can gain independence, do better over time, we spend a lot of time in the industry talking about how can you raise your income? How can you raise your investing returns? And again, that's fine. But unless you are putting in effort as well to managing your expectations, managing your, your material aspirations, managing your ego, which is what a lot of that is, 
you know, that is a lever that you have more control over by and large than what the stock market is going to do next. And it is just as influential in terms of how well you do over time. Of course, this is the, the most obvious statement in the world, but if you make a million dollars a year and spend 1.1 million, you're worse off than someone who makes 50,000 a year and spends 40,000. Of course, that's the most obvious thing in the world. But that, that, that's a big thing that drives a lot of financial outcomes in the world. It's just, it's not how much money people necessarily make. It's the gap between how much they make and what they expect. And one other analogy here that has to do with health is there are a lot of people who spend a lot of time and energy and money exercising. They go to the gym, they have a personal trainer, but they still find it very difficult to lose weight. And there's a lot of medical studies that show exactly why this is. It's a very simple formula. To grossly uh, summarize it, if, if someone goes to the gym and burns 1,000 calories, and then after they go to the gym, they've, they've burned a lot of calories, so they're hungry, so they go to McDonald's and they eat 1,200 calories of hamburger <laughs> after, right after their workout, yeah. they're in a worse off position. And so in that sense, it's not necessarily how hard you work at the gym that leads to losing weight. It's what you burn at the gym plus the food that you avoid afterwards. It's the gap between what you burn and what you eat afterwards that's going to help you lose weight. It's the gap between the two. And it's the same for finances. It's not necessarily how much money you earn. It's what you earn in the context of how much you're pushing aside and saying, I, I made $100, but I'm not going to spend it. I'm not, I'm not going to take that. I'm going to leave that gain where it is. That's what builds wealth over time. It's very easy to overlook that and assume that income equals wealth when it, it, it really doesn't. It's income within the context of your expectations and your material desires and the gap between the two that builds wealth over time. So I've heard you say that the hardest financial scale is getting the goalpost to stop moving. We've got quite a few young listeners, and I think this is a really critical concept as they advance their careers and start making more money. What do you mean by that? And why is that so important? If you are someone who is lucky enough to have a rising income or a rising net worth over time, you're in that position. But for every $100 of income that you gain, again, your material aspirations grow by $110, you're not going to be any better off. You're not going to feel any better off over the course of your life. And there's a way that this applies to the whole economy, which is this. The median inflation-adjusted income in the United States is twice as high today than it was in the 1950s. So the average family adjusting for inflation is twice as wealthy today as they were in the 1950s. But we still view, by and large, the 1950s as this like golden age of middle class prosperity. Like a lot of people get nostalgic for how good it was for the middle class in the 1950s, but we're twice as rich today than we were back then. I think the reason that gap exists and that that disconnect exists is because even though our incomes have doubled since the 1950s, the median income has doubled since the 1950s. Our expectations, our material expectations have grown by more than that. And therefore, we felt better off back then, even though we are better off today. And you can quantify some of this, like the median square footage of a new house in the 1950s, of a newly constructed house, was about 900 square feet. Today, it's about 2,400 square feet. So just the, like the expectations of what people think is normal and average and that they deserve has grown faster than our incomes. And that is a lot of the reason why you know, we have this nostalgia for a period where we were actually poorer back then. And it's not necessarily to criticize people for doing that because everyone measures their well-being relative to other people around them. So when people in the year 2020 view other people on Instagram driving Bentleys and taking their private jet to Bali, like that's like people start measuring their well-being relative to what they see around them. You know, lots of what income inequality has done in the last 40 years, the growth of income inequality, is it has made the lifestyles of a small set of legitimately wealthy people has inflated the aspirations of a much larger chunk of society that is not as wealthy. This again, just gets back to managing your expectations your, and your material desires as such a key and fundamental part of doing well financially and being happy with your money over time. And if you don't get the goalpost to stop moving, if you don't have some sense of what enough money is, and that you can you know, say, look, if I get a $100 raise, that's great, but I'm not going to spend it. I'm not going to go out and use it to buy a new house, car, whatever it is, but you're just going to use it to build wealth, to build independence for yourself, to give yourself control over your, your time. I think that is what wealth can do for people, but it requires getting the goalposts to stop moving rather than being someone whose income grows, but their expectations grow even faster over time. Morgan, this is awesome. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. And for those of you listening out there, please, please, please go check out Morgan's book, The Psychology of Money. You will not regret reading this book. Until next time, please continue to subscribe and tell your friends. We'll talk with you again soon. 